Genesis chapter 16, and we left off at verse 7, verse, uh, well, actually verse 5 and verse 6, verses 5 and 6. Continuing on, you might recall I explained how Sarai, she was so angry at Abram that she said that my wrong is actually on you because when Hagar saw that I wasn't able to give birth, then uh, I was, the last part of verse 5 says, I don't know if I explain every word here, so let me just do that. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, uh, I was despised in her eyes. Meaning that Sarai says to Abram that whatever I did wrong, it's on you. I gave my maid to your bosom. So that's an intimate thing, right? So she, my maid became very intimate with you, close to your side. And when Hagar saw that she was able to have a child, then I, Sarai, was despised in her eyes. So Hagar looked down on her mistress, Sarai. So then Sarai, she was very upset and she said, God's going to judge between me and you about what happened. So that was pretty bad. And I explained to you and taught you that sometimes you might get into fights like that where a woman might be so hurt emotionally, there's a lot inside that the man doesn't know about, so then she just bursts out at the man, and the man's like, where did all of this come from? What did I do wrong, right? So when you come into arguments like this, I've explained through Scripture how you can break that cycle or at least diminish it more and more. So in verse 6, this is the tendency of the man because they just don't want to bother trying to resolve the fight. Usually what men do, instead of taking charge, then they give this reaction because the woman becomes so emotional that the man's like, okay, just do whatever you want, right? So that's what Abram does in verse 6. But Abram said unto Sarai, behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. So he says, look, uh, the maid is in your hands, okay? You, uh, it's your business. Do whatever that you want, whatever that pleases you, because he just doesn't want to bother. I'm too old for this, says Abram. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. So Sarai was very harsh, was very hard toward her maid, Hagar, dealt with her very hard, and so Hagar ran away from Sarai's face. Verse 7, now we can explain this part here. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness. So the angel of the Lord, you'll notice from this picture here, let me know again if I'm out of bounds. All right, thank you. Just let me know uh, how, if I'm good or still cut off. The angel of the Lord right here sees Hagar and he discovers and finds her by a fountain. And by this fountain, because remember, they're out in the middle of no man's land or a desert, most likely. In the wilderness, right? So the verse is self-explanatory. The fountain of water by the wilderness here. The verse continues, by the fountain in the way to shore. So on the way to shore, there's a fountain. Now, some might wonder where is shore that the angel of the Lord discovered her. Well, remember this, Hagar, where did she come from? She, com she came from Egypt, right? But then Abram, because he was able to live in Egypt for a while and get a lot of stuff from Pharaoh, and that included slaves. So that included Hagar. Because Hagar was included and given as a slave to Abram, Abram took her, obviously, out of Egypt into the land of Canaan. So Hagar, because she was mistreated in the land of Canaan by Abram and Sarai, she wanted to run away and go back to Egypt. That's what it's pointing out. That's why it says on the way to shore. Because sh when people go on the way to shore, what that means is they're on their way to Egypt. Shore is like that uh, terrain or that area where people would stop or have to pass by when they want to go to Egypt. So go to Genesis 25. Keep your hand here, Genesis 25. Genesis chapter 25. 
Notice in verse 18. 18. Genesis chapter 25, verse 18. This is talking about Ishmael, and Ishmael, uh, his family lineage comes from Egypt. And it shows that when his direction is t- heading towards Egypt, it's heading, it's passing by Shur. Verse 18. And they dwelt from Havilah unto where? Shur. Notice that is before Egypt. As thou goest toward Assyria, and he died in the presence of all his brethren. So notice when you're on the way to Shur, then you're heading toward Egypt. Go back to Genesis 16 again. Go back to Genesis 16. So it's pretty plain Hagar was trying to go back to Egypt. So she had to pass by Shur, but there happened to be a fountain of water on the way to Shur. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 16 and verse 7. So again, as, we, as I explain this passage, the angel of the Lord is the one who discovers her. Now, this is the first mention of the angel of the Lord, for some of you who didn't know. It's the first mention of the angel of the Lord in your Bible. So we have to look at the law of first mention. For some people who don't know the law of first mention, the law of first mention is basically... When something is mentioned first in the Bible, then it usually defines what the rest of the verses mean when they use that word. So in other words, if we see angel of the Lord first mentioned in this passage, it's going to define the rest of the verses when angel of the Lord is mentioned. Usually, usually, maybe not all the time, but it does usually. So in this case and scenario, we have to study who this angel of the Lord is, if he's first mentioned here. There are indications that it could be talking about God, because when you look at verse 10, notice what the angel of the Lord says to her, and only God would say something like this to Hagar. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. That shall not be numbered for multitude. So obviously this sounds like something God would say, not just a regular angel. Let's look at Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. This definitely proves that this is God speaking when you look at Exodus chapter 3 verse 2. The angel of the Lord, there is no doubt about it, It is referring to God Almighty himself. So notice that God Almighty, he would sometimes, when he appears to humans, he would come in the appearance of the angel of the Lord. And when you look at angel of the Lord in the other verses in your Bible, and when you look at the mention of angel in the Bible, it takes on the appearance of humans. So if it comes down as the appearance of humans then that means the angel of the Lord is a human form. It has a human form. If it has a human form, that means God came down in human form. I thought that the first time God came down in human form, though, was obviously when uh, Jesus Christ was born into this earth, right? So then what is this angel of the Lord then? Basically, we would call it then the official, actually, let me uh, go backwards again. So, the first time God came down as a human, officially, see, officially, is Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord is not the official human form, and the reason why is because angels are obviously not humans. Angels are not officially humans. However, they do give the appearance of humans. So then, the unofficial form, human form, that God came down is angel of the Lord. But the official form is when he came as Jesus Christ, born into the human world. That's why we call it the pre-incarnate appearance. Some of you will hear that sometimes. What does that mean? You know, it's a long word. Basically, what the angel of the Lord means from pre-incarnate appearance It is referring to before the incarnation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came down here on this earth as a human, 
For some of you who don't know, we would call that the incarnation of Christ. The incarnation of Christ. When Jesus Christ came down into this earth, we call it the incarnation of Christ. The incarnate. God incarnate, we would call it. But because he came down appearing as a human or unofficially as a human through the angel of the Lord, we would say before his incarnation. Hence, we call it pre-incarnate. So the angel of the Lord is basically a pre-incarnate appearance. It is a pre-incarnate appearance for some of you who didn't know. We call it pre-incarnate appearance. Look at Exodus chapter 3. There is no doubt about it. It is definitely supported. Look at Exodus chapter 3. And then verse 2. The word of God reads, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And notice this angel of the Lord who comes out at Moses out of the bush. The verse says at verse 4, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. Why, it's God speaking to him out of the bush. But at verse 2, it says the angel of the Lord was the one who appeared to him out of the midst of the bush. Basically, that is God then. It is God. So the angel of the Lord is no doubt God, and we call it pre-incarnate appearance. Let's go back. Let's go back. Now, there are some passages, just to give a disclaimer, there are some passages when you look at angel of the Lord, it is possible it could be a regular angel as well. There are some verses that would indicate that it's a regular angel and not God himself. That's the reason why when you look at angel of the Lord in the Bible, we say that generally it's referring to God, mm -hmm. generally. Very few times it could be referring to a regular angel, sometimes even Gabriel. Some suspect it could be even Gabriel. Okay, let's look at Genesis chapter 16 and verse 7. So God finds her by the fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to shore. Now, this is a beautiful picture. You might say a beautiful picture of what? Hagar, she is a descendant from Ham, remember. Ham is the descendant of where we get Africa, the black people, and other groups, the Ethiopian. Now, look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Coming from that descendant, this is a great picture of God first appearing or a person who is able to meet God or get saved. A beautiful picture of salvation here. And notice that she is a slave as well. She is a slave. Why, we were, when we were sinners, we were bound and enslaved to sin. This is a great, beautiful picture of God first appearing not to a king, not to one of the most blessed people, but one of the people that is considered at the very low tier. A person that we wouldn't imagine that God would appear first. That's our God. It's a beautiful picture of that. There are two pictures that can uh, show it. We're going to look at first Acts chapter 8. Notice the Ethiopian eunuch right here, a black slave. A black slave, just like Hagar. Look at Acts chapter 8. And we will read verse 27. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority. What did the Bible said right here? He got saved. At verse... Um, we'll look at verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus, is the, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let's go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Another example is that notice that it's not a man, it's a woman that God appeared. It's not a man. It's a woman that God appeared. So God appeared to a woman who was living a life in sin, and she had no idea 
that God was the one who was able to give her the water of life freely. Why, God happened to appear not out in the wilderness, but by a fountain of water right here. Isn't that a beautiful picture? It's like God, he is deliberate in everything. He didn't just, uh, he just don't do things just out of coincidence. He does everything for a reason. I think that God appeared to Hagar like this because he was seeing in the future that I know what's going to happen. I'm going to appear to a black slave in the future as well as a, a sinful woman who is in need of the water of life. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful picture of our God? Yeah. All right, let's look at John chapter 4. What a great God we serve. We're going to look at John chapter 4. Notice at verse... Uh, let's see right here. John chapter 4. We'll look at verse 7. Verse 7. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water, and then that's where God appeared to her. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And guess what? Uh, God was the one who did give this woman something that she needed by the water. Isn't that beautiful? All right, let's go back. Genesis 16. Genesis chapter 16. You can preach a great sermon on salvation from the story of Hagar and the angel of the Lord. And by the way, Hagar, she also demonstrates that she was living her life in sin because she did not respect her mistress. She was mistreating her. And so in return, Sarai mistreated Hagar in return. So then she was suffering the consequence of her sin and she ran away from it all. Can you picture yourself like that? Living your life in sin. So then you deserve the consequence of your sin. You're suffering for it and you decide to run away and to just say, you know what, I'm just going to run away from it all and just probably die out here or go back to Egypt if I can make it. But guess what? That's when God intervened, right? On your behalf and gave you the gift of salvation, got you saved, yes. saved you from hell, saved even your Amen. own life and yes. turned it all around. Man, great story. Praise God. Genesis chapter 16, verse 8. Now, this is very good. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? Now, notice when the angel of the Lord is speaking to her, he addresses her by name Hagar, and he says, where'd you come from? Whence camest thou? But he says, Hagar, Sarai's maid. He could have said, Hagar, whence camest thou? But he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? Why? Because God usually, before he saves a person, he wants to address their sin problem first. Right. That's why it's important in salvation. We do believe in you cannot skip the first step. You've got to realize that you're a sinner in need of salvation. You've got to recognize your sinful problem. Right. God pointed that out to Hagar, actually. So, hey, you've got a problem right here. Because why? Hagar, he disrespect, he did not recognize that I am Sarai's maid. No, remember, she was looking down on Sarai. So it's like God's remind, reminding her. So Hagar, what does she say? And she, uh, well, the angel of the Lord said, and whither wilt thou go? So God is speaking to Hagar, where are you going to go? These are good questions to ask yourself when you're in Hagar's position. If you, want to be, if you want to have the beautiful story of God saving your life, you can't get your life saved until, and this usually happens to a lot of addicts, until they find God, or a lot of them get saved, is when they come to a point of realization that, uh, who am I? And what am I doing here? Where did I come from? Right? Whence came us out? Where did you come from? How did this happen? And then, whither wilt thou go? Where are you going to go from here? Yeah. You know why people live out in sin and they don't need salvation? They don't think these questions. Hey, where'd you come from? Where are you going to end up in? Hey, Hagar, Sarai's maid. Hey, you sinner. They don't think about these things. That's the problem. Now comes a confession right here. 
All right, not the pride that, no, uh, I am not a sinner. Uh, there's nothing wrong with my life, no. And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. She said, I'm running away from the face of my mistress, Sarai. Comes out and confess, acknowledges Sarai as her mistress and that she's trying to run away from everything. People don't recognize as a sinner that whether you're rich or poor, addict or non, uh, you're not an addict, you don't realize that there are things that you are running away. You're running away from uh, the realization that you are a sinner, you are in need of help. You're lost and drowning yourself out in the riches, the comforts of life, and everything this world offers. You're running away. That's what people do when you give them a trap. They run away. They don't want to admit it, but they're running away. They're scared of a piece of paper. You see that red light. You know, they can't wait for it to turn green. They press that accelerator mode and they go, Arr! why? They're running away. They're running away. Verse 9, and the angel of the Lord said unto her, so now God is speaking to her, return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. So notice right here that God is telling Hagar that she has to go back to her mistress Sarai and submit under her authority, her hands. Go back to, uh, go to Philemon. Philemon. That's why you can see the Lord addressed Sarai. There's no doubt about it. The reason why the Lord addressed, uh, not Sarai, excuse me, Hagar, the reason why the Lord addressed Hagar, Hagar, Sarai's maid, why did God do that? Because God wants Hagar to humble herself and to make sure that she, this time, respects Sarai's authority. Otherwise, God's not able to bless her. So Hagar has to make sure that she turns her life around, submit under the authority again. Usually for you saved Christians, you got to realize this, is that if you want to be saved, okay, and I'm not talking about saving from hell, I'm talking to you saved Christians, if you want to be saved out of your messed up life, and God is speaking to you, you got to recognize where you're coming from and you got to recognize where you're going to head off to. And also you have to recognize that you got to make things right. God can't bless you until you get things right first. As a matter of fact, you go to, back to Genesis 16, God didn't give the blessing first. God said, you got to do this and this first. You got to make some things right first. Yeah. Then after that, he says, I'm going to bless you. But if Hagar didn't go back to her mistress and submit, perhaps God would not have given the blessing to her, right? Maybe she would have died out in the wilderness. Look at Philemon. Philemon. Notice we have an example of Onesimorus, uh, who was a slave. And then Paul actually told him that he has to go back and to submit again to his master. And he wanted Philemon to forgive him. Look at Philemon, verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him. So Paul, notice he is begging Philemon to receive back Onesimus, who was at first unprofitable to Philemon, but now God, uh, not, excuse me, now Paul says that he is now profitable. He has made some things right. Yes. So he told Onesimus, the slave, to go back to Philemon. Go back to Genesis 16. Genesis 16. Now, uh, there is uh, a criticism that people might use from these passages in Philemon and Genesis. Is that, so notice right here that the Bible condones slavery. So that's their argument, that God condones slavery. The simple argument, now, this is uh, very sick and tiring to me. I mentioned this in previous Genesis studies, so I'm just going to make this very, very short. The argument that people will use is that slavery is mentioned in the Bible, so how in the world do you approve of the Bible? Well, the simple answer is this, is that God, what he does, which you should be thankful for, otherwise we would have had a riot, and society itself would even fall apart, is that God, what he goes by, is he knows the heart of man and the culture of the time, how society runs and works. 
The culture of society, you're going to notice in your Bible that God doesn't really speak out against that. He only speaks out when there are cultural areas that is considered that is sinful. But there's a lot of things that God tolerates and puts up with the cultures of that time. Even with cultural norms that he don't even agree with. For example, polygamy in the Old Testament. Jesus mentioned at the book of Matthew that God didn't originally want it that way. He wanted it where it's basically uh, uh, one man and one wife. But because that was a cultural norm that time, the Bible mentioned because of the hardness of your heart, what did God do? He tolerated it that way. So that was the culture of society that time. Because that was the culture of society, God allowed polygamy. Slavery, you got to realize this. We had a civil war, okay? We had a civil war. Or so says your, your liberal professors. That was the uh, reason why that society broke out into war. See, God knows that society is so ingrained. You got to realize society was so systemized into slavery that it would stress out all of society and interrupt into wars. So God let some things go. It's like some of the cultural norms that we practice today that God don't approve of, but God has to let some things go. Why? Because then society would break out again. So that's why God lets some things go. That's why another example is taxes. We get taxes rising up so high, and we're like, well, we don't like that. Jesus don't like it either. However, because lest we should offend them, Jesus says, he says, oh, just pay the tax like that. Why? Because society would erupt. He went by the cultural norms of every changing society that time. Why? Because God knows how society runs because of the hardness and the stubbornness of mankind. And he realizes you're just so weak. You're just so stubborn. So no, I'm not going to give you a burden greater than you can bear, which is scriptural. As a matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 2, God would put up with some of their sins so much to a point that he says, I'm not going to put upon you a greater burden than just these requirements. So God understands that. So because of culture of society, you better be thankful that your God's that type of God. You might say, why? It's not just society, it's you. Because God didn't demand out of your life as soon as you got saved, okay, make sure you, uh, you, uh, you do this, 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 all these things. You didn't get that from your pastor when you first came to this church. He let the Lord change you. He let the Lord work in your life. Why? Because God is patient with you. So God patiently works in your life, and you better thank God for that. Otherwise, you would have had a mental breakdown, and some of you would not be here today. Some of you would not even preach on that pulpit today. So don't be all fleshly and, get, and start whining about why did God do that back in the Bible. Just as much as people, if God gave them 200 years left to breathe in the future, that, uh, just as much as you would, they would whine in the future, why did God allow this to happen at the year 2022? Yeah, I wonder why. Maybe because society would burst in half and tear their hair and say, God, you're too hard for me. So God can't win either way. He goes by the culture of society, they accuse him of being immoral. If he doesn't go by the culture of society, they accuse him of being too hard and legalist. You know what your point is? You have a whining mentality. You just have a human nature that just wants to whine about everything. That's your problem, okay? So when they bring up slavery in the Bible or what not in the Bible, one, you better be, realize God is merciful. He goes by the culture of society. He also goes by the weakness, see, yep. of flesh. So God realizes that, so he doesn't give you a, greater, a burden greater than you can bear. Thirdly, thirdly the reason why God, uh, God would do that, you'll realize that there are other nations out there and cultures out there who are far worse than how God does things. Okay, you want to pick on the Bible? Hey, man, why don't you pick on the other nations during the Old Testament that were sacrificing babies? These people would sooner defend voodoo and occult witchcraft 
and, and Celtic Druids, they would try to butter that up, that society, that it wasn't that bad at that time, or Egypt at that time, and they don't talk about, what, the pagan sacrifices, the Aztecs during that time in South America, human sacrifices. Oh, they don't harp so much on that one. They, instead, they have a respect of that culture and that nation of that time. So you go to their art museums at Stanford and go, wow, that's fascinating. But when you pull up the Bible, they don't say, oh, that's fascinating. They go, oh, how cruel. Look at that, man. These hypocrites. These hypocrites. You know, I, I went to their schools. They don't fool me, bud, all right? They might fool the rest of the people with their PhDs, but guess what? I'm going to play along their game and make them look like the fools that they are, man. Bias, stereotype, the most discriminatory people that I met anywhere in all my life. All right, Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. And we'll look at verse 10, verse 10. So use these arguments. When they bring up slavery, all this stuff that they find out in the book of Leviticus, it boggles my mind. Some of these atheists, if they can't argue uh, philosophically, intellectually, reasonably, scientifically, empirically, which there are so many of those evidences now for the existence of God, it's phenomenal now, that they resort to, but what bothers me is, and they'll point out the Leviticus, that's what they always point out. It's a weak argument to me. Look, uh, look at Genesis chapter 16. Uh, I, let me put out one more argument, all right? If they're so bothered by the immorality, the so-called immorality that happened with Christianity, they don't point out with the immorality of atheism. Yeah, yeah. You know, what about the communists, huh? Yeah. Hey, they were, they were worse than Hitler at the Holocaust with its millions all right, what about communism? Oh, because of that, I guess I can't become an atheist then. I'm just so offended. Hypocrites at its finest, man. They just... All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 16 and verse 10. Verse 10. <laughs> and the angel of the Lord said unto her, so remember, get right with God first, then what? Then I can bless you. So God is speaking to her the blessing. I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be number for multitude. So Hagar's seed is going to be uh, so numerous that it's going to be so numerous in multitude that you cannot even number it. It's going to be blessed so exceedingly. Verse 11, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, so God is speaking to her again, Behold, thou art with child. So God's basically saying, Look, you're going to have a child, and shalt bear a son, you're going to bring, uh, you're going to birth a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. Okay, that's what Ishmael means, all right, or Ishmael, however way you want to pronounce it. But Ishmael is going to be the child's name. Why? Because it basic, because the Lord hath, uh, God heard her affliction, her pain, her cry. So basically, Ishmael means whom God hears. Now, this is a great story, all right? I, I don't have too much time to harp on this, but you can make a, a whole sermon just in this incident by the well in the wilderness. There's so much rich gleanings here of a sermon. Because a lot, you don't realize that today's generation is the perfect, the, one of the most perfect biblical characters that will fit today's generation is Hagar. You live out in wickedness uh, and you're running away from your problems. And a lot of times you just feel like that everything's hopeless. You're going to die out in the gloom in the wilderness. But God just happened to appear right before you. And then you cry and you're in pain, even though it's your fault. But God still hears your cries. Amen. And he's very merciful, isn't he? What a great God. What a great God. This, uh, Hagar is such a beautiful story. I would encourage any woman who's going to do this kind of lesson to teach other women to give this story and get, gain so many rich gleanings out of this. There's so much over here. There is so much over here. You can do it. Verse 12, And he will be a wild man. So Ishmael's uh, son... 
Basically, God's saying is going to be like your children. <laughs> Do you feel like your son is this one? You know, he'll be a wild man. That's right. Amen, Lord. Amen. Yeah. So he's going to be a wild boy. All right. He's basically, he's like, uh, he cannot be controlled, so to speak. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. So his, uh, Ishmael is going to go against everybody. His hand is going to go against everybody. And every other person's hand is also going to go against Ishmael in return. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Ishmael is also going to live in the presence where all his nearby brothers will be. Why? Okay, his nearby brothers. That's Abraham, uh, Abram's children. So Ishmael's seed is going to be nearby Abram's seed. Who qualifies for this? Well, the people actually uh, admit this, no problem. Uh, the Muslims and even a lot of Arabs they will admit that where they come from is Ishmael. So this fits the Arab world very well. We can see right here that current events prove, see that Bible? Yeah. It is so prophetic. Yeah. It is so prophetic. You want proof that your Bible is the word of God? Use this one, Genesis. How can the Bible predict that all the way to today? Wow. I'll, you want to prove that Bible wrong? Make every Arab nation peaceful. Never happens, God says. Yeah, there you go. There's your proof of the Bible. So it's going to be wild against other nations. Basically wild against UN. <laughs> So they have trouble dealing with that one. Also, what we know about uh, the Arabs and the Muslims, that's why their religion is wild. That's why it's chaotic. They believe in having all the uh, nations bow down to Allah, conquering them by blood. That's why there is terrorism. And then ever since 9-11, they've been getting a whole lot of attention after that. But they're also going to be uh, living with Israel or the Jews. That's what that verse points out. That's why you get those people in Palestine, or those Arabs in Palestine, living with the Jews. You got that thing going on. Why? Because God prophesied that's what's going to happen. They're going to be living with their brethren nearby. So, what a prophecy. That book is thousands of years ahead. Let's look at Genesis 16, verse 13. Verse 13. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her. Thou God seest me. Now notice right here that she is speaking to God. When you're speaking to God, you're praying, right? Yeah. So if that's what it is, notice that the phrase is, she called the name of the Lord. That's why it's important to understand you're going to get these people who just teach, the, who just make a big deal about this when it should not be made a big deal until some pride, prideful so and so start to want to get attention for himself and then they start to make a big deal out of it. They get learned from, they learn from great Bible believing teachers, even graduate from the school, then they get to prideful mode by nitpicking certain doctrines and causing trouble to those Bible believing teachers in return. And then what they do after that is when they get caught red-handed for their criticisms of Bible-believing teachers, they erase all evidence and pretend they're one of us. That's hypocritical. I don't like that. Yeah. No, you're not my friend. Right. Okay? So you'll get these kind of people. They'll start critiquing about calling upon the name of the Lord. Yeah. Okay? And then they'll try to say that it's only believing and stuff like that. Look, when you look at Romans uh, 10, 13, that is no doubt praying. Why? Because we see the law of first mention right here, all right, at Genesis. Not only the law of first mention, look at all over in the Bible about calling upon the name of the Lord. That has to do when you're talking, speaking to God. When you're talking to speaking to God, what are you doing? You're praying, all right? Otherwise, I don't know what you want to call that, okay? So calling the name of the Lord is praying. Now, I'm not saying that praying is what saves you. No, there are plenty of Catholics who pray, Muslims who pray, and etc. Praying don't save you. But what God wants is, in this prayer, 
this is a very different prayer from all other prayers. What God wants is, if you truly believe that what Jesus did on the cross, where he shed his precious blood to wash away your sins, that's the only thing that can save you, he wants you to say that to him. He wants you to say that to him. You might say, why should I say that to him? I have a question for you. What makes you so upset that you don't want to say it to him? What spirit is inside you that makes you get so upset about saying that to the Lord? That's very, that disturbs me a lot. You got to check your heart with the Lord. Don't look at your head and try to find arguments and reasons. Every atheist, every apostate Christian even, intellectual, scholar, theologian, and especially onlineers, everybody uses the head, pull up arguments. I can do that endlessly too. Forget that. Let's look at the heart. Where's your heart at in this? That will change everything. Okay? Now, we can see right here that this has to do with praying. Now, when she's talking to the Lord or praying, what does she say? She says right here, let me know when I'm cut off. She called the name of the Lord that spake unto her. So she's talking to the Lord who was speak, when God was speaking to her, who spoke to her. Thou, God, seest me. So she's saying, God, you, you Lord, saw me. For she said, have I also here looked after him that seeth me? So meaning that because hey, uh, thou God seest me, for she said. When she said, God, you're the one seeing me, the reason why, because she said this way. Meaning, uh, have I also right now, here, at this moment, have I right now, uh, the verse says, uh, now see him who was already seeing me. That's the idea. She's saying, have I now finally realized and saw the one who was seeing me after all this time? Beautiful, beautiful yeah. verse. Amen. Like, I can preach a blowout message or a summer camp sermon on that one. Basi- this is so good, guys. Thou, God, seest me. So what she's pointing out right here is this, is that basically all this time, Lord, you were the one seeing me all this time. The problem with us today is that we have this imagination. It's always the imagination, the thoughts, the thoughts that the devil tempts us, right? The thoughts that, oh, woe is me, you know, I'm all alone and, uh, you know, what am I going to do with this problem? Hey, that's, uh, you're not looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You're not looking at God who's been looking at you all that time. You're not realizing and looking at the fact that, hey, God's watching me. God's taking care of me. His eye is on the sparrow, as the song goes, and I know he watches me. You forgot that. You got to realize that with all this doom and gloom, all this time, you should be seeing this, thou God seest me. All this time when you weren't looking at him, God was looking at you. That's the idea. All that time you weren't looking at him, but God was looking at you. So that's why Hagar came to that realization and said, have I finally now at this moment uh, looked at him? when he was looking after me all that time. That's wonderful. Verse 14. Wherefore the well was called Beer Lahairoi. So that's why the name of this place is not drinking beer, but Beer Lahairoi. Okay? So what is Beer Lahairoi? Whatever that means. So remember, the verse is self-explanatory. It says, Wherefore... The reason why it says wherefore it was called Bir la Hairoi is because of that previous point, thou God seest me. That's the idea why it was named. 
What we can find out from Hebrew is that basically it means the well of living after seeing. The well of living after seeing. That's a beautiful meaning that Hagar gave to this place. Why? What does it mean? Basically, that uh, the living God was seeing me all this time. Wow. That's the idea. She was able to live and survive and not die out in the wilderness. Yeah. Why? Because you got a God who keeps watching over you. Yeah. Amen. Now, isn't that awesome? You got to realize this is so awesome. There, there's another beautiful thing out of this passage. Another beautiful thing is you got to realize Hagar came from Egypt. The gods that she knew more than the Jewish God, than Abram's God, should be the Egyptians' God. So think about it. I don't know where her faith was all this time, but I can imagine it would make a lot of sense. Uh, all she's thinking about, I'm a slave. I join uh, Abram's household serving Sarai. Oh, look at me. I have a baby. And I, I think I'm better than Sarai. Maybe if she believed in God all this time, she would have had more of a humble heart, right? That God's the one blessing me with the child. But see, she's thinking the mind of a slave, oh, he just wants a child. That's why uh, Abram wants to marry me. So look at me, I have a child. He wants to marry me. I'm going to beat Sarai one day. See, that's probably her mindset. She never thought about the uh, biblical God all this time. Wow. And then when she ran away, imagine she's that sinner She's like, I'm just going to die out here. I'm going to run away from everything. But then she obviously heard about Abram's God all this time. She saw her mistress Sarai, Abram, always praying, uh, loving the Lord, taking time to meditate on him. And then, but she's like, I'm a nobody. She probably sees that every day. And she says, why would their God want me? I'm just a slave. I'm from Egypt. Here she is, and bless God, praise the Lord. She's just a nobody out there in the wilderness, and God appears to her. Why? God could have just left her alone and died. After all, she's just a slave. There are plenty of other slaves. Not only that, you got to realize this. Why would God appear to Hagar when uh, he wasn't the one, it wasn't his will for Hagar to have a child anyway through Abram? God could have just let her die and then teach Abram a lesson. See, I told you that didn't work. Let's start a new seed. Isn't your God a merciful God? He, he, he saw the pitiful state of this woman and then he says, I've been watching you all this time. Wow. And she lived. Amen. What a beautiful picture of today. She probably went back when she left the wilderness. All she was probably singing was, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. When I stood condemned to death, he took my place. Man, that's a beautiful picture. Uh, that, you got to realize that she, she named this place Bir Lahairoi. So it was common during that time because... You don't get real estate agents and communist governments hunting you down. No, you cannot name that way. You have to go through a license certification process. No, during that time, you didn't have communists running the government and everything that time. There was plenty of land. So basically, anybody can go to some kind of property and say, I named this so-and-so. Because remember Genesis 10, that was common. When people went to different areas, they were just naming every rock and tree and property and land that they could find. Before 2,000 years later, the Caesar and, uh, and the communist governments would say, no, 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 you got to get permission from us to name something, all right? Ugh. All right, verse 14, <laughs> verse 14. I also want to add this at verse 14, an encouraging thing. She named that place. You know what you should be doing? You got to... Uh, you got to memorialize. So she kept that as a memorial for her so that she'll never forget it. The problem with you people is every time God saves you out of a rut or out of the wilderness, you forget. You don't remember. You don't put up a memorial. If I were you, I'd put up a memorial and never forget that. And never forget the experience that has transformed your life forever. But that is human nature. They forget that. And they always find a new problem to whine about. 
What, why did God give up on the nation of Israel temporarily? Because he said, you forgot what I did for you. Hagar didn't forget. So she decided, I'm going to name it. That's why it's good to name something. Maybe you should name something as well. Do you have your memorials in your life? You're going to soon forget it. If I were you, I'd mark down the date, the time, the experience, and everything. Why? Carry that experience, that memorial with you forever. She carried it forever because she named the place. So whenever she... Th so think about it. Whenever she runs away again, think about it. Whenever she runs away again, she's going to pass by this place and say, remember what you... This is Bir Lahairoi. Oh, I remember. God saved me. Why am I, what am I doing running away again? So this prevented her from running away, you got to realize. You know what would prevent you from running away? Good sermon, right? I told you, this is a lot of good sermon. You know what will prevent you from running away? You need to put up memorials like Hagar. All right, some of you don't do that. You better start doing that. That way you could, it will prevent you from running away again. Okay, let's go back. Great sermon. There's so much wealth of uh, an awesome sermon from here. The next part of verse 14 says, Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. So then the verse is pointing out that Bir Lahairoi is between Kadesh and Bered. It's between those two locations. All right, verse 15. And Hagar bare Abram a son. And Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. So Hagar gives birth to a son for Abram. And then notice that Abram is the one who named his son Ishmael. So that shows right here that Abram was able to believe this woman's testimony. Another good sermon right here is that no matter how worthless of a slave you think you are or a lowlife you think you are, you will gain respect and credibility from somebody one day through your testimony. Okay? That's really good. So keep up the good testimony. Testimony is so important. Even to a Bible-believing pastor, if a testimony is ruined, that takes away his entire power and everything he worked for testimony is so powerful never ever underestimate testimony your testimony is worth more gold than a million dollars protect your testimony as if it was your very own life Amen. because it will gain credibility and trust from other people in the future Verse 16, and Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. So Abram was 86 years old because a score equals 20 years. So four times 20 is 80 and six years. When Hagar gave birth to Ishmael to Abram, that was his age. Now that's important to know. You might say why. Go to Genesis 17, 1. Notice the Holy Spirit made a specific reference to that. Why? Why would it make a mention that Abram was 86 years old? And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit gives the age again to Abram at the very next verse, chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9. So now the Holy Spirit mentions, now when Abram becomes 99 years old, wow, how about that? There's a reason. The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So God appears to Abram again, and then he says to him, I am the Almighty God, he declares. And then he says he wants Abram to walk before him, to uh, live uh, basically, quote-unquote, Christian walk, so to speak, right? The walk of the saint to before him and to be perfect. You can see the picture here of the Christian walk where in the book of Peter it says, be holy as I am holy, right? So God wants you to live perfectly. He wants you to live holy. Why? Because we serve a holy, perfect God. So is your Christian walk perfect? Oh, my Christian walk is great. No, is it perfect? If not, you still have growing to do. See, no one is done with their Christian walk. That's why I believe no one is done. Because until you reach perfection, then you can tell me that. So we all have a ways to go. Now, God told him to uh, walk before him and be perfect. Why would God tell Abram to do that? One, and why would God tell him, why would the Holy Spirit make mention that at 99 he told him that? 
The reason why is this. Abram was not walking right. His walk was not right. Because look at this number right here. God didn't talk to Abram, notice, for 13 years. The last time he talked to him was not Genesis 16, it was Genesis 15. Remember that? Genesis 15, he appeared and spoke to him. But then, throughout all of Genesis 16, you don't see God there. Why? Because Abram's walk, he was a man full of faith walking in the Lord, and then he stumbled. Somewhere in his faith, he stumbled and tried to do things his way that seemed like a very good idea. But then what happened at the end? What happened at the end? It messed everything up. So then God had to appear and talk to a low life, a sinner, rather than to him, Abram. You notice God never appeared to Abram about Ishmael's name. No, he appeared to a low life. That's what God will do is that if you get bounced off of your walk, God's not going to speak to you, and he's going to find some low life out there who will seek after him, who is in need of him. All right, because Abraham didn't really need God because he preferred his own way of doing things to bring forth a child, not God's ways. So notice that that's the number 13. It means what? Rebellion. So Abram's walk was a rebellious walk. So he had to get back right with God again. All right, verse 2. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. So God says, I'm going to make a covenant with, that's between me and you. And, it's, and through this covenant, I'm going to multiply uh, your family, your seed exceedingly, abundantly. This is the famous Abrahamic covenant that we're going to continue on to. In this Abrahamic covenant, notice it says in verse 3, let me continue. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, so Abram, he bowed down, uh, face to the ground, as God was speaking to him. And this is what God said. Verse 4, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. So God says, uh, as for me, what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. Look, I, my covenant is going to be with you, and you're going to be a father of many nations. So Abram's not just a father of one nation, but many nations. That's important to understand. Why? Because Abram is going, to, God's going to bless his seed so much that it's not just going to be a physical nation itself. Because the only physical nation that you can get out of this one is going to be uh, the Jews that are included in this covenant. But God says that actually through your seed, there's going to be nations out of this. So it's going to include you and I, the Gentiles, we're the many different nations that get join in this Abram, uh, Abraham seed. So you're going to see not just a physical nation, but spiritually. See, you're going to see a whole bunch of different nations participating in that. Verse 5, neither shall thy name, finally, now I can stop calling him Abram. That was so confusing all this time. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham for a father of many nations have I made thee. Meaning that God says, because you're going to be a father of many different nations, you're no longer going to be called Abram. That's not your name anymore. You are, your name is going to be Abraham. Why? Because Abraham means father of many nations. I'm going to, that's how I made you, a father of many nations. Now, this is very important. It's going to, we're going to cover a lot of heresies of Galvanism, replacement theology, anti-dispensationalism uh, in the next chance to study. It's going to be a lot of good stuff. So the confusion is in Abraham's seed right here. Yeah, be, uh, this is also a good passage that debunks Judaism as well. Because we're going to see right here that when God talks about Abraham's seed, he talks, there's no doubt something physical in here. All right, You can't deny physical aspects in here. But you also cannot deny spiritual aspects here. So then Abraham's seed, you have to remember, is going to consist of spiritual and physical aspects. When he talks about spiritual and physical aspects here, that's why it's important that this seed is going to cover something that's spiritual and it's going to cover something that's physical. So Abraham's seed is going to cover physical nation Jews and it's also going to cover Christians spiritually. This 
dual application is ignored where you get tons of heresies and wrong religions. So we will exhaustively go through that next chance is Bible study, which will be definitely worth listening that you need to hear. Yeah, Father God, I pray that today's uh, Genesis Bible study has been a huge blessing, especially the story of Hagar. What a beautiful story, Lord, that you rescued my life. My life. And I was worse than Hagar, Heavenly Father. You saved me so much, and thank you, Lord, that you're using me, and that uh, you've given me something that I can name and put a memorial, Lord. My memorial is actually, where I cannot run away anymore, is Bible Baptist Church. It's real Bible believers. It makes me stick to the path that you've called me to. And I pray that these people will find their memorial as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.